I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. I used to walk to a drug dealer's house thinking I dropped dead yesterday and someone revived me. Why am I doing this? Rick Rossman, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Why did you become a guitarist? I, I've always absolutely just loved music and I wanted to be heard. You know, I felt like I was invisible and a guitar was a good way of, of Speaking. bringing that out. Yeah. I went to see Led Zeppelin when I was 15. Changed my life. I said, I'm going to do that. I looked at those four guys on the stage and I thought, you guys don't have a problem in the world. <laughs> you know, it's just a joke to think that. And I know that now. So heroin is a painkiller. There's steps, you know, it became more and more prominent in my life. It was an absolute nightmare. Got up on stage that night, big crowd playing away. It's really good. And I look down, there's blood coming out of my arm. Ooh. And I just, I just, I can't tell you. After being that kid who just loved music so much, it crushed me. I just thought, I've got to, I've got to do something about this. Oh, my God. You I know, go I know, Queensland I and know. you're a South supporter. And, and I hey, grew up. Podcast over. over. <laughs> podcast over. <laughs> <laughs> Rick Rossman, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Hi, mate. But, 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 well, I have to, to explain jump, this. You know, like it's, it, this is the uh, state of origin jersey, as you know, and, uh, and of course you're a Queenslander. But but we're going to get into that in a second, mm. of how you could possibly become a Queenslander if you were born <laughs> in New South Wales. Mm. Uh, but in any event, this is uh, Madge. I'm wearing it on the podcast. Like Hi, I Madge. Said, yeah, like I said, I would. Um, thanks very much. And uh, I know it's not about you, so the origin series is not about – Michael Maguire, it's about the jersey. And uh, I just want to do this one thing. That's better than any fucking Queenslander, Queenslander, Queenslander uh, chant that you're ever going to hear. It's, <laughs> it's about New South Wales dudes. Right now, Can I just say something Oh, you, That was your turn. Now, I just want to say that- um, Let's clear the record. Being a Queensland supporter, I just want to wish Madge the best because- um, He's such a top bloke. And, He's good too. Uh, I haven't seen him for a couple of years, and we, we've had some very, uh, we've had some lovely discussions over the years. He and I, and um, I look forward to seeing him after after the, uh, after the origin. Well, but now you can explain yourself. Oh, so my family all moved to Queensland. No, no, no don't give us excuses. Just go back a sec. Well, no, where, no were you, where were you born? No, I was born here in Sydney. Yeah. Okay. So, and how long did you live in Sydney for? <laughs> Come on, I've lived here just, all my life, uh, except okay. for three years. Okay, so so you, and what's your cop out? Your family moved to Queensland. Yes, that's my cop out. Yeah, yeah. That's not actually my cop out. It's half my cop out. I was uh, I actually hadn't been taking any notice of rugby league in the early eighties, and uh, I mean I love rugby league. I'm a South supporter, and and I, I grew up. Oh my god. <laughs> I mean, you I know, go to Queensland and you're a South supporter. And, and I hey, grew up podca- hating Podcast hating over. over. <laughs> Podcast over. <laughs> go on. Uh, oh. and, but, but why did you go for Queensland? Because they're, they won a lot. A bit, no, so. no, no, no. I, I, um, I'd been away and uh, in the early 80s, uh, you know, I was in, in the Divinals and, and we spent a lot of time out of the country and I'd come back. I think it was about 1983, and my cousin uh, said to me, oh, we've got to go see this thing called State of Origin. Now, I'd read uh, uh, quite a bit about Wally Lewis. My family all lived in Queensland. They'd all been living there in the 70s. And, uh, and so we go out to the cricket ground and we'd had a couple of puffs of something, you know, and, and we're sitting out there and uh, it was one of those games where Wally was quiet for the first half. And it was like halfway through the game, he just sort of decided to start playing and scored this magnificent try. The crowd had been chanting, Wally's a wanker to, at him. And he scored this try and the place went quiet and he sort of turned around to the stand and put his finger up at the stand and I just fell in love with him. I just thought, this guy's great and started following him. Then I became, uh, a few years later, I became friends with um, Choppy Close. Chris Close. Who, 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 by the way, was the assistant coach for Fatty Vorton when they won 3-0. That's right. That's right. Yeah, which was a mate, quite amazing. Yeah. I mean, not that I'm here to give Fatty a rap, 
but it was quite amazing. And that was like the 90s. 90s, 90, yeah. 95 or something yeah. like that territory. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and Fatty took me along to some games. Oh, really? I got to sit in the uh, – You're not Fatty's long-lost brother or something, are No. You? I you love sure? Fatty. I love Fatty. Oh, I don't look like Fatty, do I? Fatty. <laughs> <laughs> he rings me up. He used to say, you're my second favourite bass player. Oh, that's not next nice. To, no, <laughs> next to Gene Simmons. Kiss. Yeah. Um, he's a top bloke, a great bloke, Fatty. I, I really miss uh, miss seeing him on TV. Uh, when he, whenever he's commentating, I, I, I love Fatty. I think he's a genius. Um, he got me to come along to a game. Uh, I mean, I guess we're going to talk about all this stuff. Uh, uh, because of my history, because of my uh, uh, sobriety, which usually follows an addictive yes. period. Yes. So, and he asked me, uh, we, you know, a lot of those guys in the 90s, uh, 80s, 90s used to come and see us play a lot, you know, and um, and I became quite friendly with a few of them. We all of us did. And um, there was one particular player, Julian O'Neill. I remember he played fullback. Yeah. yeah. A fantastic bloke. A great player. One of those guys, when he drinks, you get out of the room. <laughs> you know, and uh, and he was in the Origin. Fatty asked me to come out to the Origin, uh, out to the training, to talk to Julian one day, and uh, went out there. And I don't know, I just sort of hit it off with Fatty, and uh, I'd met him before. We'd been on, uh, we'd been on, I think, yeah, we'd been on the very early version of the Footy Show, and um, Choppy and I just sort of hit it off. And uh, for the next eight years, I think I went along. With them, uh, whenever the origin was on, they I'd go up to Brisbane and go along with the team and sit on the bench and. So uh, it's more the dudes, more the personalities involved that you sort of not. It's not that you fell in love with Queensland for Queensland's sake, but more the people who uh, were behind the Queensland teams. Yeah, I loved. I just loved. I mean, I know it's. I shouldn't talk to you about this because you were just doing this, you know. But th- that that. Passion. I've sat on in some of the team talks, and I'm sure Ricky Stewart was like was the same when Gus he was, was coaching. The same. Or Gus, you know, they'd all, the all be the same. But there's just something up there. I don't know. The Queenslanders they travel for for days to go to the games. You know, they all you know they come from the mining towns, and they they're they're so over the top about it up there. Well, it's one of the things they win too, and like and they mm. they win it well. Like they and had- they but they lost for so long. Yeah, 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 true. They lost for so long. And I, w- I was at that game that they lost uh, 56 to 12, I think, when, when there were all the try celebrations. And I went to the, the, uh, the it wasn't a celebration, it was, you know, the after, after game function. It was bad. It's like a death in the family. It was bad. And Wally Lewis said it's the worst day of his life watching that. And, um, Following year, they started to show the tri celebrations in the dressing room, just to stir them up. Mm. And then from then on, they won what, eight years in a row, wasn't it? Yeah, they haven't stopped, and it's pretty mm. fucking annoying. Well, I, I just hope I hope Madge can work out what is the magic dust that uh, Queensland sort of sprinkle over their players to make them play better than they usually play in club rugby, for example, um, and rugby league, and also, what is going to be the magic dust for New South Wales? Because we actually don't have that magic dust. Mm. We just don't have it. We have great players, great skills, great players. can do anything. Um, mm. But like, just there's something about Queensland, they just seem to pull through on each occasion. Mm. There's, I'm just dying to know what that is. And, you know, hopefully, and Madge is a smart guy and he's pretty bloody determined. So I hope he can pull it off. And anything I can do to help me, I will help him. But let's talk about Rick Rossman. Um, I actually, and you're the very first um, rock s- superstar in my view that's come onto our show. Oh, our straight talk, superstar. very first. Yeah, mm. you are a superstar. Yeah, and you, and the, oh. it's definitely the bands in an Australian sense, especially. I mean, obviously globally, but in an Australian sense, I mean, like I like I'm, I feel like I'm sort of sitting in front of royalty. You, you <laughs> probably don't feel that way because you know you're part of it. But and, and but you know from an outsider's point of view, like I told my brother, my young brother, who's uh, sixty, 
two or three or something like that. Our time was coming uh, to do the podcast you do, with you today because he and I were in a meeting before I got it, which is why I'm about a couple of minutes late and I couldn't shut, shut him up. And I said, mate, I've got to go do this. And he went, what the fuck? He said, you serious? My brother's a lawyer and um, <laughs> hard-nosed lawyer his whole life mm. and uh, but always wanted to be a rock star. He mm. always wanted to be. We, we had to learn music as kids, yeah. um, piano because of my mum's family. So – and my brother was the only – I'm hopeless at it, but my brother was naturally good at it and he always wanted to be a rock star and he still does. I mean, on his 60th birthday, he was up there singing songs and, you know, you know like uh, pretending to be a rock star and stuff like that. And uh, But right in front of me is a real, the real deal, the real deal. <laughs> and I'd like to know – what I'd like to know is how did you become – or more importantly, why did you become a guitarist? P- apart from, you know, getting into the various groups, mm. why did you initially – want to become a guitarist? Um, uh, interesting question. Someone asked me a, a while ago, uh, you know, why, why do you play music? And um, I can say to meet girls. Do you, you, know, do you money? Oh, I want to make lots of money. I mean, that's a, that's a joke. But um, <laughs> when you're 14 or 13 and you look at the rock stars and back then there was no internet or anything so I used to get the music papers and I'd look at these photos and I'd think, wow, these guys must have the most incredible lives. I went to see Led Zeppelin when I was 15 and it was like a spiritual experience for me. I, I, I'd, I'd been learning music and I, uh, since I was five but classical, I, I'd learnt violin. I absolutely hated it and I uh, used to wag the classes at the conservatorium, go and sit in the... Uh, Botanical Gardens, wait for my dad to come pick me up and pretend I'd been to the lesson. Wait, 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 can we just stop there for a second? Because mm. that, why, why is that? Because today it's quite, by kids who go there, it's quite a coveted place to be uh, accepted into. Like yeah. today you'd be accepted in there, and I, I had this experience recently mm. with a young fella um, who, who's my godson. Like he wanted to, in order to get in there, he had to be able to play two instruments these days mm. and had to have certain school grades as well. Mm. You have to, and in his case he was playing piano and um, sax. But, mm. but you had to be at a certain level too. Mm. And everybody tries to get in there today, but mm. yet you're there and you're going, oh, oh, I hated you, it. you got PTSD hated from it. it. <laughs> I absolutely hated it. Why? It was felt, uh, all I can say now, I mean, it was boring, old-fashioned. It was like this sort of discipline. It was this horrible kind of uh, this woman, I'm sure she was very nice, but she was like uh, my grandmother at the time, you know. She was like very humorless. It was very cold. It's like being in a maths class at school, you know, and um, I used to go home afterwards and I'd set my violin up in the kitchen next to my mother and just scratch away just like I'm going to torture you. It's because you didn't like the violin though? Hmm? Is it because you didn't like playing the violin? And you'd rather play some other string well, instrument? Well, I, I wasn't sure. My mother, she just wanted me to play an instrument. Right. You know, um, I loved I loved music from when I was little. And when I was really little, my I used to get night terrors. So my parents bought me this radio. It's one of those big old Bakelite things. And it had a fault in it. It used to fade out. And I, they'd put me in bed and it'd be dark and I'd listen, be listening to the radio and it'd start to fade out. And I'd get Perfect. scared. And then I'd bang it. You could bang it and it would come back to life. And uh, so, you know, if I hear I don't know, Under the Boardwalk by the Stones or some songs remind me of being in bed in pyjamas, you know, um, the kinks and stuff like that. And I, know, I think maybe that was a subliminal thing for me. It, it seeped into me, you know, and there were certain things that I loved in, in music. You know, I'd hear and my parents used to play musicals. And opera, I hate both both those things now. I, opera and musicals, and um, but there'd be certain parts in certain songs that I, I'd, I'd get a, a, a kind of a visceral sort of reaction to, and I didn't know what it was at the time, but I, it, it was a good feeling, you know. It was a good feeling, like what, what, whether it was a melody or a chord progression or a, some words, and um, I started playing the violin. I hated it. Then I, I was at Scott's. I started playing um, cello. I loved the sound of the cello, but um, yeah, didn't really, too. you know. I, I just didn't like the the um, what's the word? The, not the discipline, because I mean you have to be disciplined to be good at music. But um, 
I just didn't like the um, what's the word? Is it too staged? Yeah. Is it too staged? It's too organ. You know, it's too. There's no improvisation. You know, yeah. there's no. Uh, yeah, you go by the script. You've yeah, got the music. That's it, that's your role in yeah. this piece with the rest yeah. of the orchestra at Scotts or wherever it was. It's like the difference between an architect or a draftsman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. you're, you're, but, 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 is that, but is that because of uh, maybe perhaps of your mindset, the way you think, that you don't, you you like the ability to – well, it's just hard to control <laughs> your thinking – because you know, like if you're playing something like a cello or even a violin, usually it's unless you're sort of so good, you're doing your solo thing. Mm. You're in an orchestra or something mm. like that. Like that, you know, the, the uh, conservatory of music about those days about building people going to the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. That's where you ultimately ended up if you're any good. Mm. And if you're really good, you become the soloist in in the SSO. Mm. Um, but if you know if you're pretty good, you're in the in the in the team. Mm. And then you've got a part. You've got a bit part to play. Mm. And that's it. You got no. There's no, uh, as you said, improv. You can't just say, "Oh fuck you!" I'm just going to start doing this. <laughs> well, it's like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you, 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 you know a lot about rugby league. I mean, if you've got a player like um, Andrew Johns or someone like that in your team, you're not going to say you have to do this and this and this, and this. you're going to let them play their own game. Yeah. And I, I, I just didn't like that. I didn't like that about the classical music. You know, I, I just. I wasn't really interested. And, I, and then I started to hear, you know, the rock music and I started to become really interested in, in, in that, you know, in the late 60s. And um, I loved the, the freedom, you know, I'd hear Jimi Hendrix and I remember sitting on the steps of Bondi um, and someone had a radio on and a whole lot of love came on. So it would have been 1968, 69, and everyone went quiet. I was like, what's that? What is that noise? It's so so exciting. I found it so exciting, and uh, there was a guitar in our house. I still don't really know where that guitar came from. I often wondered where it was. It was an acoustic guitar, and I picked it up, and and I, I found that I could. I, I I I didn't pick it up, and I could play it, but I I um, I loved it straight away, and. You know, my parents had thrown their hands up and said, oh, we, you know, give up trying to make him play an instrument. I picked that guitar up and improved really quickly. Just self-taught that? I've and, always been self-taught, yeah. And, Never had a lesson. And, and, and where did you go from there? I mean, like, I mean, the pub scene was pretty alive in those days, but where did you go well, from there? Well, oh, it took me a little, you know, I mean, I was at school and um, I just, when I, when I went to see Led Zeppelin, <laughs> It was, it was a funny thing, you know. Uh, I I remember watching them, and and you know, I think most people when they're growing up, they're uncomfortable. You know, teenage when you're a teenager, most teenagers yeah, yeah. are uncomfortable. Totally awkward. And I, I I always felt, you know, I felt first of all, I felt invisible when I was a kid, and I also felt because of stuff that was happening in our family, and uh, and um, I felt that I, someone hadn't given me the the playbook. About life, you know, and everyone seemed to have it sort of sorted. And I saw these guys, these four guys, play, and there were thirty thousand people out at the showground. No lighting, no nothing. It was just purely the music, and um, changed my life. I, I just, I mean, I was I was playing music, and I loved music before then, but I just saw that, and I said, I'm going, I'm going to do that. And um, well, my grades at school went down after that. And I was just, that's all I could think about. But how, well, how, well, what did you do next then? So, like, you, you said, I want to do that. I want to be, like, in a Led yeah. Zeppelin band. Yeah. Like, See, I, I, I looked at those four guys on the stage and I thought, you guys don't have a problem in the world. One of them died. <laughs> you know, one of them ended up a heroin addict and one of them lost one of his kids. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's just a joke to think that. And I know that now, you know, but, but, uh, Naivety, though, it's it's a it's a big bonus in terms of um, give, empowering you to do things. Because if you knew, if you weren't naive the reality, and you knew the reality, you may never have done it. No, it might have been a constraint. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I I've always absolutely just loved music, and I found you know I've improved quite quickly. Then I I just found some other like minded people around where I lived in the eastern suburbs, and. We'd kind of get together whenever we could and make this horrible racket. And um, my mother was running a, a theatre 
And my godmother actually sat me down one day. I, I don't know, this was a seminal moment in my life where she was an actress. She was in, do you remember um, They're a Weird Mob? You yeah, yeah, that? I sure do. Yeah. And she was in that that film and she she was uh, she was a great woman. Her name was Doreen Warburton. She I remember the th- writing of how they advertised it. It was very um, sort of 60s uh, flower power. That's right. Looking. The way that the, the writing of the of, yeah. of the on the on the advertising for the for the for the for the movie for the show yeah yeah, yeah I remember it. it's I about remember. the Italian yeah Italian yeah, yeah guy. I remember yeah. well and uh, just funnily enough our singer in the Hoodoo Gurus has bought the rights to that and they're oh, writing really? a musical for it at the moment but um my my godmother sent me down one day and my fourteen year old fifteen year old brain I don't know why I, I actually paid any attention to it but she said to me you know if you if you're going to um, be a musician. You're thinking about a career like that. You have to be. You have to have your own thing, your own style. Now I don't know why I thought that why that sunk in, but uh, when I started playing with other people, I became quite neurotic about that, about having my own thing. So what what, what does that mean, though? To so know our own style of playing. Yeah, what does that mean, though? Tell me. What, what do you? Pers- what do you- well, I guess your personality comes out through the instrument. And what is that? What what? How did in- angry? <laughs> really? Was it? Yeah, I was. Was it angry. aggressive? Aggressive. Yeah, I was. But was that your personality? Or was that what you adopted for? Well, it was purpose? frustration. It was more frustration. I'm not an. I wasn't an over, outwardly angry person. I was very quiet when I was, you know, back then. But um, um, I was frustrated, and I just didn't. I wanted to be heard. You know, I felt like I was invisible, and a guitar was a good way of. Of Speaking bringing that out, yeah, and you know, people nowadays. It's, it's funny. We're doing a, a gig oh, a few years ago. We we do these things called Day on the Green or Red Hot Summer, and we're playing with Daryl Braithwaite. His bass player came up to me and and said, um, "Oh, you know, I really like the records you played on. How do you get that sound?" And I said, "I can't really. I don't know. I, don't, I can't really answer that." And he kind of got the shits with me. And said, oh, keeping it a secret, are you? <laughs> I said, mate, I don't know. There was just a way that I found a guitar could, I know it sounds corny to say it, but I could kind of express myself through this piece of wood with wires on it, you know, and I could, and I just, and I still do, you know, I love the sound of bass guitar it makes when you hit it hard. There's a great quote of Angry Anderson's, you know, no one hits a guitar like an Aussie. Why is that, do you reckon? Well, that was a bit later on. I mean, there, there's a whole uh, Australian sound that happened in the pubs here. It was very, very unique. Can we? Can you talk about that? Because we, we, that doesn't. We don't see that anymore, really. I mean, that's not a thing today. But it was in the '60s and '70s. Mm. It was my period. And it '70s, was, '80s, yeah. And it was awesome. Like I remember going listen to groups like Hush. Yes. And uh, yes. And. Uh, uh, you know, I, I used to love Ray Brown and the Whispers. Yes. Uh, you remember Ray Brown and the Whispers? Yeah. It was fantastic. And. Uh, and I, these days, that sort of stuff doesn't exist. I don't think. I mean, not that I go to pubs anymore, anyway. Mm. But to be honest, with you, but like, but it, it was a thing. It's an Australian thing, yeah. Oh, mate, it was huge. It was huge, and it, it, it's the sound of how can I put this? It's a four on the floor. It's like being in a car on a highway, you know. And we used to spend all our times driving. And there was this kind of uh, energy in the music. Uh, it but started. Does it, does it come from you or from the crowd? Or well, it comes from uh, a confrontation, really, with the crowd. So you in the seventies, mid seventies, most bands played in church halls. You know, in the country, you know, they do. The, and this was before my time. When I joined, the pubs were just starting. And that was in Melbourne. I, I first played in my, my first professional band in Melbourne and play six nights a week in these pubs. And um, I guess it. by the time I got back here, the beginning of the 80s, it was, it was huge. You'd go out to these, you know, there was no internet. Uh, no Spotify. No <laughs> mobile phones. People would work all week and want to go out and just, no O O H and S, you know, so you'd get two thousand people packed into a pub. It used to rain inside; it was so hot. And you'd play, and they, if you if you were introverted, or if you were kind of shy, or if you were, 
you know, insular or in any way or they just throw shit at you. Serious? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we – this thing happened, we call it, you know, the, it's it's – you ask someone from Guns N' Roses or Nirvana or all these bands overseas and they talk about an Australian sound, which is this sort of aggressive aggression. And it's um, even, you know, artists like Paul Kelly have it, you know, where they had to sort of confront an audience in a pub. Is that for real though, yeah? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, mate. Some so, nights. and then how do you dominate? Is it about then? Then you're confronting, but it's also then I'm going to dominate this audience. I'm going to get on top with my sound. Yep. And my movement. Yeah. Sound. Yeah. And they wanted to, you know, they wanted to be satisfied. If they weren't satisfied, they'd throw stuff at you out there. How and, good's and it was glass, and it wasn't plastic. Yeah. Cups. How good is that? Though? I mean, I sort of like it. I mean, I shouldn't say that, but I, I sort oh. of like it. I mean, and I was in a band that had a female singer. That made it a bit tougher. And she, but, but hey, she confronted him. Oh, and she, she was in a. I mean, there were no other female singers who did that. Then you know, you had Renee Geyer and you know, but not a rock, rock singer. She was, um, she was one, one. She was on the outer, you know. And she, people didn't take her seriously. And out of all the people I've played with in my life, I mean, she was the real deal. She in, wasn't in a no, she wasn't a novelty act. Oh, she was. It was her spirit, you know. It was it was her. She and she learned when she first started uh, in the band. She would stand with her back to the audience, and uh, and she learned that uh, she could be a personality. She learned that kind of from Barry Humphreys. Really? How well, Barry Humphreys could say or do anything? Yeah. In character. Yeah. And she learned she could do the same thing in character. I mean, she was a pretty fiery woman off stage too, but she confronted those audiences. We'd go out to those big suburban pubs. This is the early 80s. And, um, you know, the band was um, an energetic band anyway, but she, uh, you know, some guy would yell stuff at her in the crowd and she'd be into the crowd and fighting people. And Are you serious? Absolutely. I had to get into the crowd, pull her out of the crowd. And people learnt pretty quickly that the crowd's learnt that she wasn't to be messed with, don't uh, not be trifling with nah. her. I mean, how, how, does that give you, uh, did that energise you though? Absolutely. Yeah. Incredible. And she, she, we used to, I mean, she's an incredibly beautiful looking girl, Chrissy, you know, and she'd be doing a kind of monster act, we used to call it, you know, at the crowd. She'd be up on the PA or she'd be, yeah. you know, doing this. And she'd turn around and look at us and she'd give you a look like, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> You know, <laughs> and you'd look out there and there'd just be, you know, there'd be fights, all sorts of stuff going on out there in the crowd. It was wild. They were wild times, could, wild could, times. Could, could you sort of um, give me a, a description, so a line of description, like, yeah, a bit of a description, maybe a narrative. When you're, when you arrive at the pub mm. that you're going to um, perform at mm. and, uh, be, and you're, just setting up, you're all, you guys. You know, I guess you set up before everyone arrives or something like that. But like, what's the feeling between everybody, you and the rest of the band, before you actually get on the stage and perform? Like, what are you guys doing? Like, Do you mean now or no? Then back then, just back then, before you knew you knew you're going into a confrontation. You knew this is going to be full on. You knew the particular venue you're at. Yes. It had a reputation yes. amongst you and amongst others. Yeah. Um, what would you be doing? I don't know. I guess you were behind a stage, but at the back of a room somewhere. Like, we, what was the feeling before? We had a we had a thing. You drink a thousand vodkas. What no, are you doing? No, no, you couldn't. People used to would say to me, "Oh, you guys must have been really out of it playing." You couldn't do it physically. You couldn't do it in a band like that. It was a workout. Like the Hoodoo Gurus are a workout too. Physical workout. And the Divinals were a physical workout. You could not do it. Um, we'd. We we'll have a have maybe have a, a drink before, but um, what what then? You we'd play in these big suburban pubs, and you'd go out there, and there's quite often, you know, there are no facilities. Yeah, you know, it's ridiculous. You'd have you'd to get, share the dunnies and whatever. Oh, maybe we'd get changed in the cool room, or you know? <laughs> and sometimes there'd be motels attached. So they give you a motel room, and we'd all be in there, and Chrissy. You'd, how do you warm yourself up? Well, everyone, everyone go quiet. Really? Yeah. Into their respective yeah, zone. Yeah, you'd, you'd warm up on you, you know, and 
we do it in the gurus, you know. Everyone goes pretty quiet and we don't really let anyone in in the last half an hour or 40 minutes. I mean, even today, my wife, when I've got it, when I have to play, my wife says, oh, he's got the head on. That's what she'll say because I get the performer's head. Yeah, I start to think about it. And then it was, uh, it was, there was much more, what's going to happen tonight? It's like yeah. anticipation. Yeah, what's going to happen? Is there going to be a big fight? Are people going to get up on the stage? Road crews back then were guys who were, it was, the music industry was starting, starting to become a lot more professional then, early 80s, but essentially a lot of the guys who were roadies for you were guys who'd been in prison or, you know, they were guys to protect the band from the audience. And, you know, quite often you'd you'd be, after a show, you'd be um, going out to the car to leave and there'd be guys out in the parking lot because, you know, you've smiled at some girl in the audience and some guy, you know. The bloke's ready to yeah, dock yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And the crew would be out there trying to, you know, microphone stands and and then everyone would be drunk, you know. Um so you 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 so you be you, you're very um, uh, performance focused and or focused. We'd listen to ACDC just to wind yourself up a bit. A few so- ACDC songs. We'd turn right up in the dressing room and get ourselves revved up. And Chrissy, I mean, everyone would get in their thing, but Chrissy would would get very very sort of focused. And would she be like the? I don't want to call the leader, but like, was she the person who? kick shit off, uh, like up on the stage, like f- you guys are at the back strumming away, et cetera, but like, but she would get up the front of, of everybody and start to wind the audience up like oh, yeah. with her own performance. Yeah. Like as she I mean, said. People, but, people didn't, you know, I mean, the band, it was a great band. People came to see her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She was an incredible performer, great singer, um, just so different, so unique, you know. It's like she's like Angus Young. Yeah, she's, I remember her well. You know, I mean, did you? Can you? Get, were you? Um, uh, your senses are all going. Like you're up there on the on the stage, mm. and your sen- your senses are going mental. Like uh, obviously, mm. sound and mm. watching what people are mm. doing, and what you guys are doing. But mm. like, what about things like smells? And can, can you remember smoke? Yeah, what beer. Would, yeah, beer and smoke. Beer and smoke. You come off stage, and your your clothes would be soaking wet. And you put them in your bag, you go home, you open your bag to get your clothes on, it's just like an ashtray. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with beer. You know, there'd just be beer spilt everywhere and yeah. And then and, and, and in terms of sound, can you mostly just hear the music or you can hear the audience? What what do you No, hear? you don't hear the don't you hear the sound really. Yes. Yeah. You don't really between songs, you know, people yell stuff out and And what were they sort that? of saying like Oh, they'd say stuff to Chrissy and Get your tits out as well. Yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. like that. And she'd be into the audience. Oh, she'd rip in? Oh, she. Oh, mate. She, she'd be gone into the audience. And what the fuck did you say? Yeah. And she'd be, she'd have bad, she had bad eyesight. So quite often she'd jump on the wrong guy. <laughs> and be going, no, it's him. And then the other guy would be sort of running away. And, but she, people got scared of her after How? a while, you know, because she, she was, she was, she wasn't very big. Feisty. No, she, she's not very big. No, she's like uh, she's feisty, but, yeah, full on. Oh, yeah, feisty. Only woman I've ever had a physical altercation with. Really? <laughs> so how do, what is the, uh, the the interaction between various members of the band? Well, um, so in the Divinals it was like a dysfunctional family. We were, we were a gang. When I first started playing music, and this is, you know, it's different these days, but I, I just, I wanted to be part of a gang. I didn't want to be part of an orchestra. I wanted to be part of a gang. Yeah, yeah. And the Divinals, out of all the bands I suppose I've been in, it, it was very much like that. We used to fight between ourselves, but any outsider was like, no. Nah. You know, we're very protective of one another. We spent so much time together on buses and planes and, you know, then, you know, we'd go to America for six months and uh, there was no internet, you know, and you'd be in Oklahoma and you'd try and make a phone call to Australia and they'd go, what? In the hotel. <laughs> you, know, you had they to wouldn't... get them connected. Yeah. So you'd be quite isolated. So we learned to, you know, we became quite quite tight. And rely on each other. Mm. Um, but then you would fight with each other oh, too. 
incredible Because you're with each other too much. And, and then Chrissy and our guitar player, Mark, became, were in a relationship together. So that was. Made it harder. That was a whole other thing. And, um, oh, we've, I've got m- many stories of going to Melbourne and get two hire cars in Melbourne and Chrissy and Mark. They'd set off with our tour manager and the three of us getting the other car driving down the Tullamarine Freeway and there'd be Mark walking down the middle of the freeway. He'd have a argument. Yeah, and he's, you know, he's, I'm not playing with her <laughs> anymore. I've had it. And, you know, so many fist, you know, punch ups and. <laughs> but it was a mad. It was uh, intense. Yeah. You know, and after you finished playing, everyone would drink and whatever, do whatever else. And, uh, and it was intense and it was chaotic. But look, you'd finish what, like you, you'd finish your set at like, I don't know, in those days in pubs, 10, 10, 30 or something. Oh, yeah. Oh, sometimes later than that. A bit later, but then yeah. then, then what? Because, I mean, then you're completely fucking hyped up. Yeah, so it depends what where we were. Then? Yeah. So if we were playing, say, in Sydney, we'd all go, there was a, used to be a place, I'm sure you probably knew it, called the Benny's. Mansell Room. I remember oh, Benny's. 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 Yeah, well, we'd be there. You go to Benny's, yeah. Oh, yeah, many, yeah. That was scary. I knew if I was in Benny's, I was in the wrong fucking place. <laughs> Because <laughs> you know, like uh, uh, I knew the bloke who owned the joint, Grant, uh, Ken, or Kenny Carter, oh, oh. and uh, well, he's one of the owners, and yeah. he ended up necking himself. But um, it was a fucking scary, like it wasn't a scary place. It was cool, but like you knew you you're in trouble, <laughs> you know, like especially if it was especially if it was Sunday night, right? You knew you're in trouble because right. you know, like Mike has had to go to work the next yeah, day, yeah, and, yeah. You know, start turning to work, and those days to a law firm at nine a.m. and. Uh, and uh, it was Ooh. it was a pretty greasy wake up, you know. And, yeah. And, oh. but, but so Benny's a good example. Yeah. Um, well, there so was the Mansell room. Do I remember the Mansell room. Yeah. 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 So that was a place that you could go and and you know the, you'd meet up with a lot of your peers there. A lot of other bands would be coming back and hanging out there. And many a time, I, I lived in a I lived in Paddington uh, then, and uh, uh, I'd walk out. You know, the sun coming up, walking home from the Mansell room. With your guitar sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, and they were fun. Yeah, it was fun. Fun. It was fun times. So, I mean, obviously you, you ran a bit of problem, yes. personal problems. So, like, yeah. how does that shit happen? Like, how did you – I mean, I know how the, you can start taking drugs because that's the – that was the, the vibe then. It was like, you know, most people don't realise, but in the 80s there's a lot of coke around. Uh, like, everyone's getting drunk and taking coke. In the 70s it was – more more heroin, yeah. A lot of pot, yeah. Late sixties and seventies, a yeah. lot of pot. Was it just a natural movement for you? Well, uh, so heroin is a painkiller. Hmm. So, you know, some people lo- like the up drugs, hmm. but it was explained to me once by a guy, a doctor. He said, you know. Heroin comes from morphine. Morphine was developed for soldiers, basically. Mm. Who, and morphine is not actually an anaesthetic. What it does is remove fear. Is that right? Yeah, and it it's it 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 works on a certain part of the brain. It's not it's not like a an anaesthetic. I mean, it's a painkiller, but it it works on a certain part of the brain that removes fear. And so that's why you know some people love those drugs. I love that drug. I you know it it. it I first had it in the seventies, and didn't didn't really think about it all that much. I, I, I had it. There were some people I, I'd started playing with when I f- left, first left school, and they were older than me, and they they had some, and uh, I smoked it, and uh, thought it was terrific. But I didn't really think about it because I was I was uh, how, how do I put it? I was uh, fulfilled by what I was. Trying to do, you know, the music and the excitement and playing with people, and that's all I wanted to do. And and the drug thing, I mean, I always smoked pot and did whatever. I you know, always enjoyed that, but um, uh, it didn't. It came back into my life in the eighties when I moved. I moved back up here from Melbourne, and um, it seemed to in the seventies, I guess, you know, because of Vietnam, there were a lot of. Uh, Heroin came into Australia much more than coke, especially here in Sydney. Mm. You know, you know the band Aerosmith. Yeah. So this is a funny little anecdote. I always love this, but you know, they're all in recovery, all those guys now. But we did a tour with them in the Divinals, 
in, the, in America in the 80s and they're all trying to stop taking drugs. And their guitarist, Joe Perry, who's kind of the second coolest guy in, in, you know, in, in music, you know, he's great. And we had a great time with them. They were great, great guys and we did six weeks with them in America and it's a story in itself. But I remember talking to him one day and he, he says, um, what's the coke like in Australia? And I said, well, it's not really a thing there, you know. This is in the 80s, you know. It's not really such a – I mean, in America in the 80s, it was everywhere. You go into a bar and people had it on the bar and I said, it's not really – you know, we're much closer to Southeast Asia in Australia, so it's much more of a heroin sort of thing there. And he looked at me, me without a touch of irony and said, I've got to get down there. It's <laughs> 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 great. But, yeah, I mean, it was everywhere. It was um, well, in your was, world. In my world, it was a circle of friends I had. Uh, they started it started to come in and on the weekends we'd, you know, do it. I was in a band called uh, Matt Finish before the Divinals. It was a great band. It was doing really well and it sort of seeped into that band a, a bit and, uh I didn't see it as as a as a problem then. It was easy to easy to take to. You didn't have to inject yourself. You smoke it. Yeah, you know, smoke you put on, it. You, you soak your weed in it or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I really put on tin foil and smoke it all. You know, but um, and when I when I it's if I look at it, I can just see there's steps. You know, it became more and more prominent in your life, in my yeah. my life, my friends, and then when I started playing with the Divinals. Um, I think pretty much because we were away so much. You know, we were we were in America for for months, six months at a time, uh, and there was coke and alcohol, and you know, but we were traveling, and uh, I didn't really think about it. And I'd come back to Sydney, and someone has died, or someone's gone to jail, or someone's disappeared, and. You know, it's all getting kind of dark. And um, then uh, I guess uh, in the mid-'80s I, I had a, a partner and she said to me one day, you should stop taking that stuff because it could become a problem. And I was really offended. I said, I have, what? I can stop whenever I want. She said, try. And I couldn't. And then I, everything went downhill from there and it became this... It was a, it was an absolute nightmare, and it was like a secret. I could keep it a secret in in my world, uh, music industry. You know, everyone's kind of pretty out there, especially then, with alcohol and coke and speed and drugs like that. And heroin had a certain stigma. You didn't tell people that you were doing heroin. Yeah, and, yeah coke uh, was cool. That's right. Marijuana was sort of cool, still yeah. a little bit cool. Yeah. Uh, but heroin smack no, was a bit of a – Mention that and people sort of grab their wallets and yeah. back away from you, you know. Well, it was King's Cross and it was sort of like prostitute. Well, like yeah. it was a part of that yeah. sort of a bit darker scene. So I can give you a little example of the progression. So, so 1982, I go up to the Mansell Room and they would basically roll out of a carpet – They'd come in, what do you want? Do you want this? And, you know, don't, free drinks, this, and meet this girl. And he, oh, yeah, Rick, oh, nah, you know. By 1985, I went up there one night with a, a guy who was, a new, who was in a band from New Zealand and we both, we both used some, some dope and we'd gone up there and they had these bouncers, these two guys who worked there who were notorious. One of them ended up going to jail for murder. But they were big Islander bouncers and they, they were famous for bashing people. So I've gone up there and heroin makes you vomit sometimes. And we'd had this heroin and I ran to the bathroom and I'm in the bathroom in the toilet and the door gets kicked open. It's one <coughs> of these Islanders. He grabs me. He says, right, I don't like junkies here. We're going to take you down the back alley. And I said, I'll just go. And they go, no, 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 you're going to come for a walk with us. And uh, my friend knew one of them and he said, oh, look, he's, he's a member of the Divine, so we'll, we'll just leave, we'll just leave. He said, well, fuck, fuck off. I remember thinking, how things have changed. <laughs> yeah. You know, 
that's that's the progression, you know. And, then, and so, what happened though? They let me go then, but uh, other things started happening. You know, bad things, fuck ups. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I kept playing, but it took away the great thing. It took away my love of playing music. It took away absolutely. Well, what's great about that? No, no, I'm no, no, no. I'm not saying it's great. Right, it's, I'm saying it 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 removed it removed that. It stole removed, your spirit. It removed everything. I mean, they an alcoholic. They call alcohol the great remover, and the same with this. It just starts to re- remove stuff out of your life, you as know. in strips your soul away, sort of thing. Absolutely, you become. It took away my personality. You know, my um, I was a pretty social person. It took all that away. It uh, took away my love for music. It took away my family. You know, people sort of started to back off and. I just wanted to be um, left alone pretty much. Then it became about managing myself as just to be normal. So people think, you know, it's a party or something. It's not. It's it's about survival. And, uh, you know, I, I, if I had the money, I, I was drinking in the mornings, but I just, I just couldn't stand just being without anything. If I was sober straight it felt so horrible so mm. horrible and i'd go my family lived in queensland and i'd go up there and and uh, i'd stay with them for two weeks and for the first four days i'd be physically sick coming off but then physically i'd kick back pretty quickly and i'd be all right physically but um emotionally or mentally or spiritually you know like this hole inside it was just awful and and life was dull and heavy and I said if this is what being straight is I, I can't do it and um, you know I tried that each time I, I'd go up there it was worse it was it was harder and uh, you know addiction is uh, I know a lot about addic- addiction now and and I know that it has nothing to do with rational thinking. I mean, you can have people who are social drug users, social drinkers. They might drink for th- like my sister will do it. You know, she'll smoke pot or and then just stop and won't. She'll say, oh, "I don't feel like any." My son is like that. I don't feel like a drink tonight. You know, I wasn't like that. When someone is uh, a, an addict or has the disease or whatever you want to call it, the disorder of addiction in them. It has nothing to do with rational thinking. You can walk up the road and see girls walking. Oh, there are hardly any of them there anymore. But, you know, and you ask them what they're doing and they go, oh, I'm just going through a bad time. I'll get it together. It makes you do things that you would not normally do. It makes you, it turns you into a person that you don't want to be. And, you know, you lie to people and you, you really... Um, it's it's bleak. It's it's awful. Well, it's what awful. what what negative outcomes did you? I mean, apart from the emotional stuff, but what negative outcomes did it did it did it to you in terms of it affecting your life, your business life, as that as in being a guitarist? I mean, did it affect your relationship with the divinals? And then I became what was that? very quiet, withdrawn, and in the end, I had to leave. Did they ask you to leave, or no, you, you I, made I, a decision? I, I told them. Yeah, you just took took the just round the corner from here, actually, in a house. Yeah. 200 yards from here. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I just wanted it all to stop. I, You know, and I I knew that uh, I'd had a few close calls of dying. dying. I'd started to use it intravenously. I, you know, um, my health was terrible. Uh, never had any money. That was, you know, I mean... I, I often think, how did I, how did I actually live? I, can't, I don't remember going to the supermarket or, you know, I, I just, I guess, other people took responsibility for me in a way. You know, I had a, I, I call her a hostage, a girlfriend. You know, who, who looked after me for a while, but. Um, uh, also, I mean, I was going away too uh, with the band, and I'd go away, and I. would I don't know. The last year was was very difficult, very difficult to try and keep it together. A friend of mine puts it, it's like you've got a balloon of full of water and it gets a hole in it, so you put one hand up and another hole and then it gets another and you're trying to stop it all, you know, and you get 
you just get tired. I got really tired of it. Physically, mentally, oh, everything. I just wanted it all to stop. And at the time I thought, oh, maybe I just need to go to the country for a few months, you know, get myself together. Fresh air. That's what I thought, you know. As they say, all good junkies go to Queensland. Yeah, <laughs> suntan. Um, uh, yeah, I just. Well, what was the moment where you oh, thought, mate, I'm going to go, I'm going to rehab or I'm going to do some, actually yeah, do something? I had a that. couple of moments. There were a couple. There were, uh, there's a, st- a story I had uh, that uh, I told Nick, actually, Nick Fordham, about this. And uh, he, he's sort of uh, trying to organise for me to do, to do this book of stories, you know, but uh, uh, where I was, um, you know, I like gallows humour, right? I'm, I have a Jewish background. I like the, the, you know, you can talk about the most horrific stuff in a funny way and I like that. And uh, But I was, um, I used to uh, go and meet this woman in Coles in Redfern. She used to. There's no mobile phones. She'd you'd ring her and she'd say, "I'll be in Coles between two and three. So you'd go, and she'd be walking up and down the aisles with the trolley, and she'd you'd buy your dope off her. And I, I was on the corner of Cleveland Street and South Dowling Street before the you know it was a freeway, waiting for my partner in crime, who was a drummer in the Divinals, to pick me up. And these two blokes approached me, these two young guys, and they said, "Can you come with us?" Took me around the corner, and they pulled out badges and they said, um, they were young, younger, younger than me, they were mid-twenties. And they said, we've been watching you and it looks like you're casing a house to break into. And I said, no, no, I'm waiting for a friend of mine to pick me up. He goes, all right, he leans over and in my pocket, he pulls out a syringe out of my pocket. And he says, uh, you got any drugs on you? And I said, no. He said, you're going to get some, are you? And I said, yeah. And he said, where are you going? I said, Bondi Hotel. He said, of course you don't know the name of the guy who's selling it to you, do you? And I said, no, I don't. So he's radio. And he turns to his partner and he says, you know this guy? I'm like, oh, fuck, here we come. And, you know, when someone starts talking about you like you're not there. So they start having this conversation. Remember Selena's three weeks ago, you know? And the guy said, oh, the choir boys. He said, no, no, not the choir boys. Look, he's the guitarist. Oh, the Divinals. Oh, yeah. Oh, I remember. Oh, you know, they have this conversation. I'm just like, devastated. And um, I see my friend drive past in the background. He's driving around the keep, park. Keep driving, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, this cop turns around to me and he puts the syringe back in my pocket and he says, um, he says, you know, you, you've got a career you play in this band, a great band you play in, you've got this great career that most people give, give anything to be in your position. And look what you're doing. You make me sick. Fuck off. Really? Get out of my sight. Whoa. <laughs> and then what did that, was that like a wake-up call to you though? Oh, it was a definite crack. In a moment. The, you know, and I, but I mean an hour later I didn't really think about it because we went and got some drugs. But but the the... The uh, big one for me was um, we had gone to Brisbane to play and, and you know, you were asking me about what, what it was like before and before a gig and this is 1987 and uh, we had done this, we had done this big tour called Australian Made with Jimmy Barnes. It was first of those sort of big day out concerts and in excess Jimmy Barnes to violence. Wow. There's a film of it. And the models, mental as anything. And we'd done that and I, I was just trying to keep this together and I'd have a little bit of dope in the morning just to be normal, you know, so I could get through the day and appear normal, do my job, struggle. And uh, we went off to play after that and uh, we had gone to Melbourne and I was gotten really sick, sick in Melbourne and we went to Brisbane to play, and we're playing one of those big suburban pubs in Brisbane. And it's amazing, you know, when they, they talk about street cunning, what you can, if you're really desperate, what you can get together. You get quite, get quite creative. 
and I got on the phone and I've got this drug dealer in Sydney and I said, can you dro- drop this stuff off to this friend of mine? And he took it to our office and I told them at the office uh, that I had this really important cassette that I needed. So and one of the guys was coming up to see us up in Brisbane. They waited all day and he arrived and he said, I've got this cassette for you. Beauty. I've got this cassette. Go out to this gig. This big pub and I was I was physically sick, you know, and um, running around, you know, Chrissy runs into the bathroom, of course, and takes the bathroom. I'm thinking, where am I going to go? So run around. I remember in this panic before the gig and I found this bathroom and I had this little shot just to, all of a sudden I'm like Popeye, you know, with the spinach. Oh, great. I'm like, oh, what was all that drama about the last few days? I'm perfectly okay. And got up on stage that night, big crowd and playing away. It's really good and the lights and the sound. I look down, there's a little bit of blood coming out of my arm. Ooh. And I just died. I just, I can't tell you. After being that kid who who, who just loved music so much, and I, I just loved, just, I was, it was my life, you know, I was obsessed with it. And, uh, and I just... No one else saw that, you know, I, and I just it crushed me. I just thought I've got to, I've got to do something about this. So it was yourself. You did it. Well, I saw it, yeah. And I, I the next step was two days later. I was in, uh, we we were in Malula Bar, and I went to see my mother, and um, I told her, and her and my stepfather, and. It's the first time I'd really told anybody, what, you know, like that. I mean, other people knew, but it was my family. And my mother, I remember, said, oh, we knew there was something wrong with you. We didn't know what it was. So now we know what it is. So then I uh, went to see a, a drug counsellor 100 yards up here who, who was a methadone clinic then, and I don't know why they didn't put me on methadone, but they sent me to a hospital and I was introduced to AA, NA and recovery and I had no there's a whole different world I I'd never seen anybody stop and be happy about it I'd seen people go to jail or die or die I had and some friends of mine who I used with disappeared I had no idea where they were and they found out where they were they were sober and they kind of grabbed me and dragged me into this sort of other world which which uh, it took me three years of to actually uh, uh, surrender to it, to the recovery. I kind of relapsed a couple of times, and is that about admitting, admitting to yourself that you were an addict first? <sighs> yeah, it's admitting that you you're done. It's like. Don't get back in the ring. You're going to get the yeah. crap beaten out of you. Just don't get back in the ring. Yeah. And uh, and once you do that, you're set free. It's a sort of a dichotomy in a way. You know, it's it's like admit that you have defeat and then you're set free, or you, depending on this fellowship or what you know, and uh, you, you you have this freedom, incredible freedom. And um, I, uh, you know, I'd always wanted. I just, I, I always just wanted to live in the world with some peace and, 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 and feel, you know, okay about myself. Never had that. And I, you know, I thought that if I could get famous enough or if, I mean, money, I, I had never made any money then, but I thought if I could just get enough of something, it would fulfill me. And it never did. And or when I, you know, I, as a kid, I, I dream about being in a band touring America, and I did that. But the more of that stuff I got, the more drugs I would use because I found that that did not fulfil me. And you know, I'm just one of those people who my sister's not the same. We grew up in the same house, but I have this thing in me that's like a, a hole, you know, and I try to fill it with different things and. Uh, I mean, I'm not religious at all, um, but I, um, you know, I just life, life on life's terms was never enough. I mean, how, do you still have that hole? And so, how, how did you? Let's call it. How did you either get rid of the hole or how did you fill it? I mean, what? 
Well, it's a so this is this is where it can get dicey talking about it, but because I'm not, I have to stress that I'm not religious. Don't like religion. You mean the institution religion as opposed to spirituality? Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's a, and what I do is a spiritual thing, and it's a spiritual malaise. You know, it's a spiritual lacking. It's a, it's, and I had to basically. I mean, it sounds really corny to talk about it, but you know, I had to find out who I was. You know, I'm not. You know, what I do is not who I am. You know, it's it's. I had to find. You know, just find. Myself, really, and then I found out that you know I'm good at playing a guitar, and and uh, and you know got asked to join the Hoodoo Gurus, and it's fantastic, you know. But I thought I really thought that part of my life was over, the music part. I thought I'd that was it, and that was my chance, and kind of blown it. But um, everything I have in my life today is because I went that route, the recovery route. And um, every day of my life, I'm grateful for it. I woke up this morning and went, okay, great, you know. Was about, is it because you felt, is it because well, you woke up? I get up? nervous. I was coming to see <coughs> you, you know, I think, oh, you know, but, you know, I, I, I have this sort of... Um, you know, it's hard to talk about a faith in, 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 in not in, in myself, but uh, the recovery has made me believe in myself and I, I'm okay in my own skin. You know, when I used to go to the Mansell Room in the 80s, I had to either go home with drugs, alcohol or a girl. Hmm. I couldn't stand going home by myself. Was that because you were uncomfortable with yeah. yourself? Yeah, perhaps 100%. And now I'm not. And uh, how does someone get? But how did you find that out? Like, how did you come to terms with that? Like, did someone guide you down that process, or did someone tell you that? So, the last couple of years, or the last year, couple of years of, of using drugs and alcohol and the chaos of it, you know, it's my, I'd have, I'd. I, I quite like going to see a psychiatrist. I run rings around a psychiatrist, you know. <laughs> You get to talk about your favourite subjects, you know. But, um, you know, I had people, there were a few people in my life who knew what was going on and, and uh, you know, people would do this to you, you know, oh, this is bad, you've got to stop, it's bad, what are you doing? Get yourself together, pull yourself together, stop, you know. I think, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll just stop. Genius, what a great idea, just stop, I couldn't. I used to walk to a drug dealer's house thinking I dropped dead yesterday and someone revived me. Why am I doing this? You know, I, I know people who have left their kids at, at a dealer's house as collateral. I mean, why would someone do that? And why would someone sell their body on the street? You know what? You know, you see your mother crying, begging you to stop, and you go, yeah, I'll stop. And you mean it. It's sincere, but... You can't. You don't. And this is the thing, you know, people don't understand. You know, it's something that's bigger bigger than you, you know. It's like um, a counsellor said to me in a, one of the hospitals I went to, she said, what are you going to do when you leave? I said, go to Queensland. She said, that's nice. She said, if you had diabetes, would moving to Queensland fix it? I said, of course not. She said, well, you need to look at it like that. You need something outside yourself because you on your own are not going to win against this. And uh, she was right. You know, I tested it for a couple of years and, uh, and I relapsed and, until I just went right off. Enough. So, so is, and is threw myself into it full. You know, I made it the, the most important thing in my life. To, to, in other words, the most important thing in your life is um, to cure yourself. Yeah, to, well, to open myself up to recovery. I don't think I can cure myself. But I have to do it. Yeah. I have to take responsibility for myself and do it. I'm not. If I sit at home and think, okay, well, I'm going to fix myself now. It never worked. But see, the pr- pr- most profound, one of the most profound things was, um, you know, I'd never seen anyone give up. You know, I love. How can I explain this? I love what drugs did to me. You know, I love that that feeling. But 
hated all the other stuff that happened. And so I found out that I couldn't have one without the other. You know, if I'm going to drink, that's going to come uh, something, all this other disastrous stuff will happen. So, you know, I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to have to give up this thing that I love. Then I, I remember uh, I was in this hospital and these two people came and they did what I, I do a lot of this stuff now myself, but they, they came in, they do what's called an H&I meeting. They stands for hospitals and in, institutions. You go out to hospitals, jails, talk, and just basically you just tell your story. You don't say, you've got to do this. And that's what they did. They told their stories. And it was, I sat there looking at them thinking, these two people, they look pretty cool. They were both like four or five years sober, happy. I thought I'd never seen any. I wasn't happy about it, about having to give up all that stuff. I wanted all the dark stuff to stop, but I thought surely there must be a way I can have a drink down there. Or, yeah, you know. And they, I said, what do you do? You know, they said, oh, we go to these meetings and we, you know, told me about recovery and and um, and I, you know that was that was that was pretty pretty profound. You know, I thought. Then I thought when I first started to look at the the, the AA thing, I, I thought, oh, great, you know, I'm going to be in a little suit selling Bibles in Bondi Junction. That's what I'm going to be doing. No fun anymore. This is a penance, you know, for what I've been, but it's the, quite the opposite. And um, do, you, do you reach out to other people now? Yeah. And have you been doing it? Yeah. Like reach out, like help yeah, other help people. other people yeah. that you that you know have got the same issue that you Absolutely. you had and have. Went out to Long Bay Jail two days ago. Oh, really? Mm. And you and you tell them your story. Yeah, I've been doing it for well like thirty years. Is now. that part of your therapy 100%. for yourself? So I I, I had this uh, moment where I, when I was a year about a year sober, and we had this big gig in the Hoodoo Gurus at the Entertainment Centre. It was f- Great night, terrific. We had this album out, it was all happening, it was great. And you know, I'm thinking, wow, you know, I've got my life back. And and then this friend of mine, two days later, said, Come with me, I'll I'll get your clearance to come out to the Long Bay Jail and do this talk. So I went out with him. I was walking out of the jail afterwards, and I had this feeling, and it was a fulfilled feeling. And I remember thinking, this is what I always wanted. This is what I wanted two nights ago. And don't get me wrong, the two nights ago when I was playing, terrific. It was great. But this was different. This was a different This for you personally. Thing. Yeah, it was different. And um, I mean, it's, it's corny to talk about. No, it, it's know, not corny. But, no, it's just But actually... it's like you help another person. Now, you do it, mate. I know you do. And when you help another person, I, I mean, I'm not some sort of uh, – Mother Teresa and walk around the earth for helping people. I don't do that. I do it for selfish motives. I was going to say I do it for selfish reasons because yeah. it is fulfilling. Yes. And I don't get the fulfilment in any other way. Right. And I do my mentor show for that right. reason. I mean, right. I'm, I'm doing exactly what you're talking about, and yeah. it is, but it is for selfishness. I yeah. remember I had Danny Abdallah there sitting one day and he runs this program about forgiveness after his kids were, yeah. uh, you know, killed yeah. by that motorist. And, uh, yeah. and he said – same thing. He said, I run the program Forgiveness for myself. It's for yeah. selfish reasons. It helps me deal yeah. with what i got to deal with. Yeah. And uh, I get I get 100%. Like, yeah. so, and, and I think maybe sometimes some of us, maybe you're one of those people too, nearly take 60 years to work this shit out. That's right. Other people work it out really young. I don't know yeah. why the fuck they do, but yeah. how that happens. Um, but well, yeah. it took me a long time to yeah. work out what I, what really fulfills me, yeah. fulfills me. I always thought it was about making money or yeah. – you know, smashing the banks, all that sort of yeah, stuff. I mean, that's yeah. a bit like you're playing guitar. Like, I mean, I'm out there in the confrontation world. I love mm. the confrontation. Mm. Mm. I love the challenge. Mm. But mm. what really rocks my boat is about sitting and talk to you, listening to you talk, telling me this story or mm. do my mentor show. Mm. And it's, it's interesting. I'm glad you told me that because it's, it's sort of reinstated in my mind. Sometimes we just do because that's what we do. Mm. I do the same thing every day. Mm. And I forget why I'm doing it sometimes. Mm. And sitting here with you today mm. is usually reminding me of mm. it's okay to be selfish. 
mm. and look after yourself. Mm. They go, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether it's addiction you're trying to deal with or whatever, it doesn't really matter. No, I think everybody has their own things, you know. Uh, my, that was my path and, and uh, you know, I, I mean it's what it's done is when you're fu- – for me, if I'm fulfilled as a person, it it affects every area of my life. Like the marriage I have, for instance, you know, I have a great marriage. Now, I, my relationships were chaotic in, in my past. You know, I like there's a great saying, you know, about recovery makes the ordinary extraordinary. It's a great saying, yeah. and it, you know. I needed I used to think how do people how do people go to the park? How do people go and have a meal and enjoy that? And how do people, you know, I wanted all this stuff, you know? And now I do. And uh I mean, you know, I get to play in a in a great rock and roll band too, which is a huge bonus. Where, where, when's your next uh gig? When, when um, oh, when? we're playing we just, we just stopped. We we stopped a couple of weeks ago. Uh uh, we've got our next gigs in Brazil. Wow! In, uh, in August, and we've just announced two days ago. It's 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 so great. I can't tell you for a band like us, we we're constantly shaking our heads it just because we always think, oh, this will be the last year. We've thought that maybe the last fifteen years, but people still come, you know. And uh, we've just announced this tour, uh, Australian tour in November, which is just selling. Really well, and um, yeah, it's still, still, and you know, we 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 have a very high um, bottom line. You know, we 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 play really well, and we if people come to see us, they it's, it's a good it's a good uh, night. If know? Rick Rossman was to compare himself with um, Rick Rossman when he first um, joined the uh, Divinals, and you were playing in pubs, and you know, you had uh, Chrissy mm. up the front, and mm. and you, as you said, it was sort of confrontation and all that sort of mm. stuff in the pub. If you were compared, if you compared that dude to today, the dude mm. who's now in the Huda Gurus and is mm. going to play in Brazil, mm. um, what's the difference between the two? No, no, I don't mean in a personal sense and, you know, like but like how you how you play, how you um, address the audience. Obviously it's not pub environment, but how what is the difference between the two? Is it more chilled, older, mature, in control, or, or are you still into it? I'm still into it. Definitely. You can't, Same energy? Oh, mate. It, the only difference is it's physically. Yeah. It's harder. Where's you out? Yeah. I mean, we. I go swimming and, I, you know, I have to look after myself a bit, you know, otherwise. Have to know, train for it. Well, yeah, we do an hour and a half and I know um, we did a tour a couple of years ago where uh, I noticed that you, know, you get to about 50-minute mark and you're starting to go, oh, just losing my breath a bit here, you know, because <laughs> we don't. We bash ourselves, yeah. you know. We 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 go hard, and um, so I had to, you know, I started going swimming and and, um, and that and just for the stamina because we did this American tour. We were playing five nights a week. We we're in our sixties, and so you have to be, you have to look after yourself, and uh, and it was good. It's good, and it's a great thing too. Where a band like us, you get on the road, and you after a couple of weeks, if you're doing a tour like that, because we. Here we will play maybe once a week or, you know, a couple of times a week occasionally, you know. And uh, this thing happens when you when you do it with the band. After a f- couple of weeks you kind of get into this into this sort of on, on this role and it's a great feeling. It's a great feeling. It must be like when someone, you know, some of the league players are really fit and they're, they're kind of, you know, they've gone through their, their training, their pre-season stuff and so... Terrific feeling, and 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 ha, ha, what do you think about the Australian music scene today? Because I'm mean, obviously the pub scene's not what it was, and uh, you know a lot of the pubs have been yeah. pulled down. But like, what do you what do you say? How do you see it? I um, mean, we as, we are we as big on the global platform in terms of um, our impact as we were back then. Uh, like, I, it's it's very very different world now. Uh, you know, people talk about streams and. I don't know. I, uh, I'm the live thing is very different, and I feel like it's coming back. Music is cyclical, you know. It's 
Low fashion. A little bit low fashion. Yeah. It, 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 well, I hope, you know, that usually, you know, every 15 years or something someone comes along and kicks the door in a bit. And, you know, from the 60s, Dylan did it and all sorts of Beatles did it, Rolling Stones, Nirvana, um, punk rock. I hope that happens again soon. Because, I, But I look at things like, um, you know, uh, Splendour and all this, they're getting cancelled because yeah, uh, they right. can't afford the fucking insurance. That's right. And like, this sort of shit. And, that's uh, right. That's right. And, like, I mean, I, I saw uh, uh, The Roots and Blues. I don't think, I mean, unfortunately, every time they fucking hold it, it starts to rain. I don't know what the deal is. But, you know, people are sort of getting a bit nauseated by going to these events because the conditions are shit and or you get all wound up for it mm. and then it gets cancelled on you. It gets cancelled, yeah. Um, and, it, I mean, I don't know how to solve this stuff, but a lot of it's got to do with all the costs associated mm. and, and, the, and promoters just can't handle it. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, uh, who was um, who was the guy who just came a few months ago called Fred? Freddie, uh, uh, Fred again. Fred, Fred again. Fred again. Yeah, but well, he killed that. it. Like he just got oh. announced it like that morning. Well, all the, I mean, the, and the, they all just lined them up. Yeah, all the venues were booked. Yeah. It was all planned. Yeah, yeah, totally. But 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 the people didn't know. Like no, the, the people didn't know. Of it. And because I had the the boss of TG here the other day, um, who promoted him and. Mm. Uh, who was that? Um, Colin? No, Not no, Colin. No, no, no. Colin's Who's Colin? Colin? No, Colin's from Jeff Jones. Uh, Jeff Jones. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff Jones. And yeah. uh, he, had a, he came on our mentor podcast yeah. and uh, he it was like it, it was staged but still like incredible. Filled, he filled it up. I mean, I just don't I just don't get it. I mean, it just does my, you know. I mean, I remember when Dire Straits sold out, what did they do, 20 entertainment centres. I understand that. This I don't understand. I, I just don't. It's just it's a phenomenon, you know. And Colin, who was one of the promoters, said now there are a lot of acts who are going to try and do the same sort of thing in America and they won't It's because it's a, it's a, it's a kind of it's a phenomenon really what he did. I mean, it's incredible what he did. Totally. Like, uh, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I. For me, I don't want to go somewhere where there's today. I mean, I used to go to the pubs all the time mm. when I was younger. Uh, but today I don't like the idea of uh, – I don't mind listening. I, like I, I like to – I actually do like to listen to my favourite music and or musicians um, streaming or on Spotify. I just, do you play vinyl at home? Do you have a record Yeah, yeah, player? I've got a record. I've totally got a record player. Oh, you have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I wish I'd – I was wanted to bring you something. 100%. I'll bring you some vinyl. Yeah, I, 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 I've, I've actually got a – I got it at home, and I got one on my farm too. Right, and uh, and uh, and I only just decked the farm one out more recently. Right. Um, it set it up more recently because yeah, I love vinyl. Yeah, I'll, I, I'll, I love I'll get you some. Who also, got, I also got CD. I also got a CD player. I've got a old yeah. Bang and Olufsen, not right. old, a Bio Centre six six disc um, CD player. Right, which I fucking love. I yeah, just yeah. love it. Like yeah. uh, I play it all the time, and uh, yeah. and I mean, I and uh, I, I did. I was a triple Emma. Uh, for many many years, and mm. they love the Hoodoo Gurus. Like yeah. I mean, that's well, they're like, promoting our tour, are they? Mm. Yeah, but but you know, like Mark Guyer and uh, Matty Johns, who show mm. you've been with Cooper, um, mm. uh, uh, Gus Wallen. I'm going to one of Gussie's breakfasts uh, tomorrow, actually. Morning, as a matter of fact, mm. uh, for one of his charity, the charity he runs. Um, I'm good mates to those guys, and mm. uh, they were such. They were your biggest, um, your biggest um, media promoters. It was unbelievable. And all mm. those tradies, everyone, they because that's they're, they're the station they listen to, Triple M, mm. and uh, mm. and uh, and I, 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 therefore, I'd rather listen to that than going to a live gig today, mainly because I don't like the fucking hassle of it. I would, I do go to Splendor and things like that, though, if I'm away. Yeah, I mean, I've got, I got a farm up Byron, so I will, right. go, I will go to those things, right. and uh, and put up, put you know, cop the crowds because it's much more relaxed. But doing what the the younger people do today, what I did when I was younger, just going out on Saturday night mm. and uh, doing my best to get there and doing my best to mm. sort of crawl back home, mm. uh, I don't know whether I could do that these days. Um, and I just wonder whether people who like me who are used to that pub scene, mm. we've all got older like you have mm. and uh, we just got a little, <laughs> a little bit more chilled. You know, my, my closest friend in the world is is uh, a drummer in Midnight Oil, Rob, Rob Hurst, and they were doing their last tour. And um, 
his wife, who's looking after the seats, you know, friends and family, she rings up and she says, oh, I've got you a couple of passes, you know, you, things for the gig. And I rang her back. I said, Leslie, I've got to ask you, are they seats? They've got to be seats. Yeah. Like, I'm not coming. Yeah. You know, two hours. Yeah, your legs are fucked. Huh? Your legs are fucked up. Oh, after. mate, I can't. Do, you know, and I always used to joke, you know, I'm in a band, but get out of the audience, you know. I don't want to be in the audience, you know, and uh, I, 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 I go and see people, you know. I, I went and saw um, who did I go and see recently? Oh, uh, Cheap Trick. Oh wow, sensational! That was so good. Then I went and saw The Damned, you know, the English punk band. That was terrible. But I go, you know, I go out and see people, but I can't. I'm not going to go and stand in a pub for two hours. No, nah. I can't do it anymore, and I don't really like it, you know. Uh, and we're doing the Enmore Theatre this year, so Enmore's great. So you should come. Yeah, we'll come. come, on, come when, on. when is that? That's in November. Yeah, no, Enmore's great. It's yeah, yeah it's and but, but you don't you don't do pubs. There's no pub scene anymore. Well, we do. It? We occasionally, yeah. occasionally, we d we'll do them. Remember the Bag of Moon Bar or Kuji the Kuji uh, Selena? No, oh. the, well, that's that's Kuji. Uh, that's a Kuji. Bay Hotel, yeah. Salinas, but yeah. there was one up the road called. It was called. It's now the Holiday Inn. Yes, yes, there used I to be remember. A pub, yes, to think, yes to be the a bar, Oceanic. The Oceanic, but there was a yes. bar at the back called the Back of the Moon Bar where they had the bands. That's right. And I, I saw Dragon there. I, I, I saw Dragon there to myself. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and, and I guess you were sort of you would have been around. You probably before Dale Braithwaite, Dale Braithwaite period. You guys, the vinyls, the were, Gurus, or the the vinyls, the vinyls were before Daryl. Would that be right? Because Daryl, no, Daryl. Daryl was the eighties. Yeah, who's eighties? Yeah. But the Divine was like more like yeah. late seventies. No, eighties. We started in eighty two. Oh, right, okay. Because because yeah. uh, he lived around Bondi somewhere, didn't he? Uh, I, there was a house no. in Bondi in Pankerville Street. Everyone used to say like a big giant. giant There's only a house there and uh, yeah. the rest of apartments. And everyone used to say Daryl Braithwaite lived there. Oh, you know who used to at the end of Pankerville Street? Yeah, the end when of you go across yeah. Old Southhead Road up to you know yeah, yeah. Birriga Road. Yeah, there was a big house there. All of my sex used to live there. Oh right, maybe I'm getting all confused. the hippies. Yeah, all I, the hippie I, saw, I saw remember it like everyone used to talk about it all the time, and yeah. uh, and you used to sort of drive past and fucking think to yourself, but, it was a bit of a mystery to oh, me. Mate. But. And when you know, I, I just had to tell you just a great a great moment in my life when I was you know left school and I'd go out and I'd see Sherbet and Skyhooks and Ariel and Piranha and all these bands that were around. I oh, obsessive and Billy Thorpe and you know oh, I'd go I'd sneak into pubs if they were playing pubs, but they were usually in 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 other venues. Billy Thorpe and Aztecs. Yep. And I saw every, I, I, you know, I was obsessive, you know. I'd go and see everyone and uh, Daddy Cool and um, and I loved Skyhooks, you see. And I loved their, their lyrics and, and their send-ups, the yeah, yeah. stuff that they did. And I remember getting right up the front of the Bondi Lifesaver underneath Red Simons and yelling at him and anyway, I, I, my career uh, started in Melbourne and it was completely by accident and, You've probably had moments in your life where you, you, you're kind of confronted with something and you think, logically this is not right to do, but, and I'd gone to Melbourne to visit a, a friend. I knew one person in Melbourne, she said, bring your guitar. I went down there. She said, there's this band. You should go and have a play with them. And I had up here, I was, wasn't was playing live or anything. I was trying to form a band with people and it was hard. And these guys are older than me. And they, I went for an audition and they said, you want to stay? We play five, six nights a week, all original music. And uh, it was like I remember standing there going, yes. I mean, it, it was just the logistics of it were just crazy. I didn't know anyone. I had no money. And I get taken off by these guys, right? And um, for a week we played at some suburban pubs and we had a gig in the city in Melbourne, and they were from this Carlton scene in Melbourne and they were all older than me and they were quite well known in Melbourne. My first gig in the city, I'm in the dressing room and they're all in there, Ross Wilson, the guys from Skyhooks, uh, guys from Ariel, you know, they're all in the, in the dressing room. They were coming up to me. I'm like <laughs> this kid and they're all coming over and going, hey, you know, welcome. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And probably very inspiring to like oh, motivate the shit out of you. Incredible. What was incredible. the name of the group? That Bleeding Hearts it was Bleeding called. Hearts. The great guy in that band was a guy called Martin Armiger who went into a band called The Sports 
And Martin wrote, went on to write a lot of soundtracks for Australia, uh, Australian films and TV and, and ended up, uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, but he, he was the head of um, Afters, Australian Film and Television School, a genius, but was a, a mentor for me. And he was like this, back then he was like this sort of Keith Richards type, sort of pretty loose sort of, uh, a great songwriter and just one of those... Charis- very charismatic people you meet in your life. Do you, do you, last question for you, Rick, did you ever think about and or feel that you are one of the still standing great Australian guitarists having covered off like two really, two, two really well-known bands and lots mm. of others but really well-known bands is still here. Do you ever feel as though that you um, have a really important place in the history over the last 50 years? Nearly not for quite 50 years, but say, you know, nearly 50 years history of rock bands in Australia. Do you, do you know that that's the person who you are? Or do you just think, no, no, it's, that's not me? And it's pretty important because, you know, like, like those two coppers <laughs> in uh, Redfern who recognise you, uh, you know, like maybe you're not going to be necessarily recognised but you're going to be known. They, people know mm. you. They know who you who mm. the band you're with. They know the songs you were mm. playing to. Um, they know the venues you played at. Mm. Does that ever dawn upon you? Uh, sometimes I, you know, our, our, the two bands I've been in, the Divinals and the Hootagers, have both put, been put in the Australian Music Hall of Fame. So As they should be. So we've, I've been put in there twice. Now, I don't think about that. Glenn A. Baker, do you know Glenn, yeah, Glenn yeah, A. Baker? Yeah. So he comes up to me one day and says, you know there's only five people who have been put in. The bloke, he wears the hat yeah, and yeah. he's a great speaker. Yeah. He says, there's five people who have been put in twice. Rock historian. Now, I don't, I don't think that. And he says, Jimmy Barnes? Wow. Ross Wilson. Wow. Glenn Shorrock. Wow. Then there's Gary Young, who's the drummer in, in Daddy Cool and Joe Josep and myself. So I said, rightio. So I got Gary Young and we had some photos taken together because we're the two blue-collar, faceless, blue-collar workers have been put in twice. <laughs> you know? <coughs> That's I don't, as in Joe Josep and the Falcons. Mm. Back, we're going back to the 70s. 70s, 70s yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, the, you know, I, I don't... I, but you I'm, are a dude, I'm, man. I'm like, very uh, grateful, and I, you know, I, I, I'm very grateful, and I, I still, I'm still really active. I'm, I'll send you something after we finish. as something I'm doing with, with uh, some cricketers and footy players. That's that's uh, interesting, uh, and you know, I'm writing some songs. I'm trying to do a book. I'm try, uh, writing songs with my friend Rob Hurst, and we've done five albums together over the years uh, called The Ghostwriters. And they're all commercial disasters, uh, but uh, <laughs> but you had fun love, doing it. Love doing it. Um, I, you know, I like enjoy playing more than ever, probably. And I and I teach at a uni uh, in the city, and and I really get off on that. Um, I've been doing that for twenty years, and uh, and that's a whole different world, you know. Trying to you have to keep changing every few years, changing the way you relate to. Uh, you know, like I started 20 years ago and I'm teaching 18-year-olds and the thing is now... They're 50. <laughs> yeah, but I'm still teaching 18-year-olds yeah. and I'm I'm 20 years older. And you have yeah. to adapt. And how do they relate to me, you know? And, um, or how you relate to them. How, yeah, it's, and it's interesting. It's it's good, you know. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. And, I mean, I you know, my, my son, I remember, said to me one day, Oh, you know, you must have walked around in the 80s just going, oh, this is amazing, what an amazing time. I said, no, it wasn't like that. It's, I'd get the worksheet from the agent each week, you know, and we go, okay, well, we're playing here and, oh, there's going to be a, that's going to be tough, that gig, and, you know, the Goman Cutter out of Blacktown, like that's going to be a bloodbath. And, you know, that's what it was like. You just live kind of from week to week. And um, I don't. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky, you know. I, I, my friends, uh, they keep me grounded. And uh, when I when I first went into recovery, this great woman, an amazing woman who worked in a detox here who saved lots of people's lives. And she saved my life pretty much. And she said to me, she used to call me Richard. 
She looked like Dame Edna. <laughs> and she sat there and she said, Richard, if you're not careful, your ego will kill you. Now, I didn't understand what she meant because I've never been someone to walk around saying, don't you know who I am? I've never done that. But she meant about finding who I am really and just being kind of having some humility. And being it. comfortable with that. And being comfortable, yeah. And I, I you know, I don't. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't walk around thinking, "Wow," you know. I don't. But I'm very grateful that I, I, I've had a, had this incredible career, and I've got to play with amazing people. And you know, like you, you know, you know some you, your friends. Yeah, but not in your game. And uh, yeah, but you, you know, I mean, look, sitting here with you for me is like. Fucking wow! Like, oh. Seriously, and you don't get See, it, but, it, don't, but that's okay. But I, for serious, it is. It is, it is wow, because I feel like you are sort of royalty in, in rock oh. and roll sense for me. See, we did we did these interviews a while ago for Rolling Stone, and they, and they they wanted to do as individually. And this guy, he's a rock and roll journalist, and he's kind of there, and he's Mister Cool, you know, and he's asking me all these questions. He said, "So you uh, you." been travelled around a lot and you've, you know, you must have met some incredible people and what's the most exciting one? And I said, well, I've sat in a room with Mick Jagger but I was much more nervous meeting Wally Lewis <laughs> <laughs> and the look of disappointment on this guy's face. He just went, he's a foot play, football player. And I said, absolutely. And it's absolutely true. When I met Wally Lewis, and he's a friend of mine now. Wally. Well, the reverse to see us, yeah. the reverse applies to me today, and I want to I want to say two things, yeah. um, probably three. Congratulations on a wonderful career. Oh, thanks. And it's not finished; it's going to no, continue, finished, and your yeah. continuation of it. I want to say thank you for everything you've given to your audiences, mm. of which I was a a small part of your your much larger audience. And finally, I want to say. Thank you for your honesty today about mm. yourself. That's really important. Mm. Um, I really appreciate it. Rick Rossman. Oh, thank you, mate. Man, no, seriously, thanks a lot, mate. Thanks, mate. <laughs>